أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ومولانا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد اللهم صل على محمد قال محمد وعلى أهل بيت الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين لا سيما بقية الله في الأرضين روحي وارواح العالمين له الفداء رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقه قولي Alhamdulillah brothers and sisters we've had the tawfiq of discussing many divine promises up until now promises that if we believe enable us to be able to experience God's best to live our lives as we should and then not only to have successful personal lives but also fulfill our social responsibilities so that inshallah we can be among those people who welcome the imam of our time. Now brothers and sisters, we've been talking about those promises and also ways to apply them. Now we're going to talk about something a little bit different tonight. One of the ways of experiencing God's best. Brothers and sisters, many people, if you talk to them, they're very concerned about their diet. There's a lot of people who want to make sure they're eating organic foods. They want to make sure they're exercising, living right. There's a lot of things they do in order to be able to experience what's best. But brothers and sisters, if we think honestly, one of the things that really helps us to experience God's best and even live longer and live better is to be in a successful relationship, a successful marriage. Actually, if we want to resist and we want to call people towards God, one of the things that we have to be doing and encouraging others to do, for those of us who are not married, is to get married. Right? We're trying to resist to protect Allah's religion. Getting married is actually half of the religion. The responsibility is even more on our shoulders if we've never been married. What we want to be very careful about, brothers and sisters, is if we're not married, to no longer look for marriage. If that ever happens to a brother or sister, that they feel so jaded about the concept of marriage that they're not even looking for marriage anymore, then that's a problem. We definitely want to avoid that. We always want to be looking for that. Afterwards, though, there's two things we have to keep in mind. And I want to mention this especially for those of you who are now fathers and mothers, those of you who have children. Please pay attention to this. In order for us to ensure that Islam goes to the next generation, one of the big responsibilities that's on the, res that's on the shoulders of the brothers and the sisters is to have a successful marriage. I say this especially for brothers and sisters who are practicing. If you're a practicing Muslim, a practicing believer, your children are looking many times at Islam through your practice. If you are doing well, the child might think, well, this is Islam. This is the message of Islam. If, God forbid, the other thing is happening, that your life is hell, misery, and it's partially due to your own mistakes and errors and ignoring Islamic principles, the child may think that what you preach is also not good. So, for instance, let's say there's a father and mother who haven't been reminded about Islam's instructions for having and experiencing marital bliss, and then this person's marriage is hell, and they're very much practicing, and their children are watching this, and we see on the outside how much emphasis there is towards breaking up families, keeping people even away from the institution of marriage, the children might also feel, well, I don't want to get married. If that's what marriage is, if these are what practicing Muslims do, if this is how they treat one another, then why should I even go towards this? So it becomes something that's even a, a greater responsibility on us. And brothers and sisters, we have to be reminded about how to experience God's bless by reminding ourselves of what Allah has told us if we are married. What are our responsibilities? What are our duties? And we learned this hadith the other day from our holy prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. where he told us that خيركم خيركم the best of you are the best to his or her family. That's the best of you. So we want to make sure that we're doing our responsibilities towards ourselves, first of all, 
towards our families, towards the future, because our children are watching this. And inshallah, this will help us to experience God's bless. Now, the next thing I should mention about this is that the advice that we get from Ahlul Bayt alayhim as is going to be different than that which we find in the West. It will be different. There will be some things that the Ahlul Bayt have to share with us which are not politically correct. But these are keys, brothers and sisters. We have to embrace Islam in its entirety. And it's actually good for us to get these reminders and make sure we're implementing and we're doing our responsibilities. In Islam, one of the things you'll learn is that we don't have role reversal. We're actually told in the verses of the Quran not to envy one another. Specifically, when Allah gives instructions to men and women, a certain amount of duties to women, a certain duties to men, we're told, don't envy the other person. Don't envy, don't covet that, those, advantage, those advantages that we've given some of you over others. Yes, we have different responsibilities, and we're going to make sure that, inshallah, we've identified them and we do them. The other important thing about this discussion before I jump into it is this. Brothers and sisters, let me be a little bit real with you guys. Yes, there is a lot of encouragement in Islam to get married. And there's so much reward. It's half your religion. But it doesn't mean, brothers and sisters, that you won't experience rough patches. Let me just be honest with you. Many times in your relationships, Allah will test you through your spouse. Now, of course, you and I, we don't want to be that person who is a cause of fitna for the other person. We're pushing the other person to their limits spiritually. We want to be making sure that we're doing all of our responsibilities. But sometimes, even in a good marriage, Allah will test you through your spouse. We have hadith. And I'll just say this from the very beginning. We have hadith. They say that if you, God says, if I see you, I'm paraphrasing his words, if I see you put all of your trust, all of your hope, in anyone other than me. If I see you put all of your hope and all of your trust in anyone other than me, I will definitely dash your hopes. Let's say I come into a marriage and I'm just thinking, everything will just be hunky-dory, it'll be okay, everything's fine, I'm doing all the right things, this person will never say anything to me that hurts me. Right? If we put all of that trust in somebody, all of that expectation, God says, I'll dash your hopes. Maybe the person, not even intending, but Allah will test us in that way. We're supposed to always remember it's only me and God. It's me and my responsibilities, and Allah will help me get through this. But yes, there are some difficulties and some challenges. Now, brothers and sisters, one of the first things that I want to talk about is the idea of actually love in marriage and how important that is. This is very important for us to hear, brothers and sisters. One of the philosophies for marriage in Islam, there's three things that are mentioned in the verse I want to share with you. One of them is mawadda. There's supposed to be love, intense love between the husband and wife. The more love, the better. We learn from our ulama. There's also rahma, mercy. And of course, tranquility, sukun, sakina, aramish. This is all supposed to be there. And brothers and sisters, If we want to have a successful marriage, we're not going to be able to approach marriage from a selfish point of view, from a point-scoring point of view. I'm waiting for my spouse to do all of their responsibilities. If they do their job, I'll do my job. The successful marriages are not like that. Actually, brothers and sisters, the expectation from you and I is to lead by example to find out what our duties are, what our responsibilities are, keeping in mind this is a whole generation of believers who are going to be affected by my decisions and make sure I'm doing my duties. So we're going to be talking about love, brothers and sisters. I want to mention something else too. For some of us, we didn't have the blessing of growing up in a home where our father and mother were very loving. Some of us haven't seen a successful relationship. We didn't grow up that way. Some of us, unfortunately, our parents divorced. Some of us, our parents stayed together, but the relationship was not that that Islam devised, that Islam had planned. So we didn't see a relationship where our parents were very loving, for instance. Because we didn't see that, that's a challenge for us. For some of us, if we're not careful, we'll repeat the mistakes of our parents. Our parents got divorced, for instance, 
And though now you see us in our relationship struggling, the first thing that comes to our minds is divorce. But brothers and sisters, I want to make share something with you. You can break the curse. You can break the curse. Just because your parents weren't successful doesn't mean you also are condemned. No, you can change this. And if you do change this, if we go over these rules that are mentioned in the ayat and in the ahadith, and you change the course, let me show you the thawab of having a, a good and a successful relationship. This first hadith is from Imam Muhammad al-Baqir alayhi salam. The imam says this, whoever establishes a good sunnah, whoever establishes a sunnah of guidance, he says this person gets the reward of everybody who acts on this sunnah without Allah taking anything away from their rewards. So how would this apply to us, let's say in a marriage? Let's say in, in my family, we come from a situation where we weren't, my father and mother weren't happy. I didn't inherit that. Some parents, some kids, they have that. That's a gift Allah gave them. But let's say I didn't have that. If I break that, so I wasn't from a home that was very loving, but now I learn to be loving. What are the rewards of that? My children will now see Muslims, practicing Muslims, in a successful relationship, enjoying one another's company. The longer they've been married, the more in love they are, that effect will go to the next generation, I will be rewarded for their actions. So this is very important for us, brothers and sisters, to make sure that we do our responsibilities. So we're going to be talking about love and our duties to our spouse. Brothers and sisters, if you don't mind, first I'd like to concentrate on our responsibility to our wives. First we'll talk about that. And then, inshallah, if Allah gives tawfiq, definitely I want to cover the responsibilities that our sisters have towards their husbands. And as I said, it's going to be politically incorrect, right? But we as believers, we're supposed to be protectors. We want, tonight, inshallah, we'll be discussing the story of Qasim, right? We would all like that our children are Ali Akbar, are Qasim, right? How does that happen? One important part of that happening is when the wife is empowered to do her job. When she receives the love and attention and care that she needs in order to be a mother and a wife. So one big step is that. So now, we're going to go now with some of the Islamic definitions that are there for marriage. But we're going to be keeping in mind our responsibility. I'll share the verse for you after. The hadith that I want to start on and I want to base our duties to our wives around is this one from Amir al-Mu'mineen where he says, he says that women are flowers. They're rehana. Women are flowers. For us, when we hear that women are flowers, for our sisters, that puts a responsibility on their shoulders. What does it mean if a woman is supposed to be a flower in her house? For our brothers, their responsibility, how do I treat my wife so that she feels like a flower. Am I doing my duty? Does my wife consider herself a flower? Does she feel like a flower in the house? Or no. She hears these things. She wishes, she hopes, she prays that I will act on some of these things. When my children are looking and listening, how much are they seeing? And by the way, even if I'm a younger adult, right, brothers and sisters, we can encourage our parents, right? Our parents, we can encourage our parents to do what Allah says, to be more loving towards one another, to give them a reason to fight for their relationship. But why is it so important for us to make sure that our wives feel like flowers? This is now especially for us living in the West. Let me quote you the verse of Quran. The verse of Quran is this. Hunna lebasun lakum wa antum lebasun lahunna. What does the verse mean? Your wives are lebas for you. And you are lebas for them. What does that mean, brothers and sisters? One of our duties towards our spouses is to make sure we take care of their needs. There is no one, brothers, right now I'm being serious with you guys. There is no one to take care of our wives' romantic needs other than us. Let's say my wife in our relationship feels love starved. Where else can she go on the face of the earth other than asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for help and assistance? Who is there to make her feel like a flower? To make her feel special? Right? So it's really important for us to take this as a responsibility. And inshallah, Allah will give us tawfiq if he sees that we're trying. So 
How do we show our wives that they're flowers? We're going to start with one of the first things for us to keep in mind. Brothers and sisters, one of the things that's very important in any successful relationship is giving compliments to our wives. Encouraging our wives to dress up, to be beautiful. The hadith says, even if women are elderly, this is from Amir al-Mu'mineen, he says, atajammul lahunna, atabarruj lazimun lahunna wa in kabirna. He says, even if a woman's elderly, it's necessary for her to dress up. It's necessary for her to be beautiful. We said women are flowers. They're, that's a need for them. Actually, the orafa tell women, stand in front of the mirror, admire yourselves, dress up, look good for yourself. Right? And think about how much the West has done to destroy self-images. How many people feel unattractive? I'm not the right color. I'm not the right size. I'm, right? And then our responsibility is to go over and encourage this. So actually giving compliments is a duty, something we're not supposed to be stingy about. And brothers and sisters, let's not be like those stories I hear. Right? I remember hearing a story once. There was an old lady and she was standing in front of a mirror. Inshallah, this isn't true. She was standing in front of a mirror, and she said, when I look in this mirror, I see an elderly woman. My hair is gray. My arms are flabby. I'm not in shape. Why don't you tell me something that makes me feel good about myself? So her husband looked, and then very quietly said, well, your eyesight's very good. (laughs) God forbid that's not the... Right? We want to be encouraging them to dress up that they can see when they've dressed up. They can see they've done something different with their hair. The first person who notices is the husband. By the way, brothers, keep this in mind. Giving compliments to your daughters also. Right? Your daughters also. That they, can, they come in front of their dad. Daddy, how do I look? They put a little flower in their hair. Their father's giving, their com- giving them compliments. Building up that self-esteem. Very important. Encouraging. Right? Encouraging them to dress up. And by the way, part of our responsibility as men is to provide clothing for them, right? Our sisters should take that time out to get dressed as one of those responsibilities. Another one that's very much important, very much important. Now, sisters, I want to say this for you guys also, and I also want to say it for our brothers. This is something very different that I've heard from senior ulama. You've heard of the concept of doing istighfaf of prayer, What is istighfaf of prayer? The hadith says this. The person who takes the prayer lightly, not the person who's abandoned prayer, the person who takes the prayer lightly, who does istighfaf of salah, this person will not get shafa of Ahlul Bayt. Will not get shafa. Just for taking the prayer light because it's not important. Right? Istighfaf of prayer. Now look at this that I've heard from the leader. I only heard it from him, but it's a very important statement. He says, I'm not opposed to women working. I'm not opposed to women having social positions, doing jobs outside the home. That's fine. He says, that's okay. But this is what I have a problem with. He says, if anybody demeans being a wife and a mother istighfaf of those duties that only a woman's supposed to do thinking that's unimportant that's not a big deal and by the way this happens to brothers and sisters I remember once a sister saying she said that if I tell another sister that I'm a housewife she said you can see the sister's eyes roll back in her head I don't want to hear about that tell me your PhD tell me your job tell me how much money you make but if you say that I'm actually a wife a mother sisters don't value it how can we change this culture? This part of being the part of the resistance, actually, for our sisters and our brothers. We don't want to think that women have only achieved when they've done something men can do. I have a PhD, well, a man can do that. I have a business, well, a man can do that. I have a social position, well, a man has that also. What is the duty that only you can do? Be a wife and a mother. And women are demeaned for that. When it comes to that hadith about women being flowers, is again from the leader. He says that no matter what a woman does outside, her position, the money she makes, she's educated, all of these things, he says that woman inside the house, she's a flower. Inside the house, she's a flower. It doesn't matter her external position. Number two, the next thing that's very important for us to do and to say is to share with our families how much we care about them, to tell them we love them. There are some people who are stingy with this. Some families, maybe for Valentine's Day. Whereas what's the believer supposed to be like? 
with our children, with other believers. The hadith I'm about to share with you, it says when you see other believers, when a man sees another man, another, I see another person, another believer, he says if you love that person, tell them you love them. Say it. He says it makes the love between you more firm. I remember the first time, I, maybe the first time I heard this hadith, I was with my little brother. My little brother is a tough guy. He's even tougher than me. So we heard the hadith. That if you love a man, tell him you love him. It's a hadith. What are you going to do? So I was standing outside my apartment. My brother is about to go down the stairs. We both looked at the hadith. He said, uh, I love you. I said, I love you too. I ran inside the house. My brother escaped. We're not supposed to be like that. The ideal way, brothers and sisters, express those feelings. Tell the person. Say it. And we're supposed to definitely tell our wives this. There shouldn't be any shame in it. I love you. I care about you. Right? Tender words. Nice words. Sweet words. That should be something that's automatic. Look at the lives of the shohada and how they are with their families. Right? The less the, the less attached I am to the dunya, the more I attached I am to Allah, the easier it is for me to love other people. What does Allah want if I love? To say it, to express it. Something else. When it comes to these things, brothers and sisters, we don't want to hold back. Being affectionate in the home. Some people aren't very affectionate. I've met people who are almost allergic to hugs. Your brother, you know, Jazakumallah okay. khaira. Whereas there are so many rewards. And by the way, the Prophet of Allah, when he would see people who weren't affectionate in their family, let me share hadith with you from Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Our Prophet saw a man and our Prophet was kissing his grandson. The man saw the Prophet kissing his grandson he said, I have 12 children. I never kissed any of them. When the man left, the prophet said, in my eyes, that guy is definitely going to the hellfire. The hadith, according to one of the narration, was this. Whoever doesn't show mercy, Allah won't show mercy to them. We're supposed to express this. By the way, also to our children. Do I as a father, when I come home, do I give everybody kisses, hugs, appreciation? I want to share a hadith about hugging. Some people I say, well, what about the rules of PDA? Can I really show? It's, right? What's the hadith versus the reward? If a believer hugs another believer for the sake of Allah and not the dunya, the hadith says this, they are told, qila lahuma, right? Two believers hug one another for the sake of Allah. Qila lahuma maghfuran lakuma. Both of you have been forgiven. All of your good deeds, I mean, all of your sins have been erased. Start with your atmal from the beginning. Just for giving a hug. So now, let's say I'm one of those guys who's, you know, old school. I'm old, one of the old school dads. I never, know in front of the kid, no, we don't, we don't hug anybody. How am I going to change this culture? The rule for PDA, brothers and sisters, is this. We're not allowed to do those things that cause corruption. Right? If I approach my wife in a certain way, that can cause corruption. But let's say I'm affectionate to everybody in the house. Right? My dad used to say, Lottie dotty everybody. Right? Line everybody up. I come in the house, I'm going to everybody a hug. Give me here, give me a hug. You come over here. Right? And then also give my wife a hug. Right? And that way it's not something strange. Daddy, what are you doing? Hello? What did daddy just do? <laughs> no, he's affectionate with everybody. Because everybody kiss on that cheek. Right? It's, it's easy. Right? So we want to make sure that we're doing this. The hadith says this. It says, if a believer will take his wife's hand, he gets 10 good deeds and 10 sins are removed. But if he gives her a kiss on the cheek, for instance, 100 good deeds and 100 sins are removed, right? Affection in Islam is very important for making our wives feel like they're flowers. Next, giving gifts is another one of the secrets of the Ahlul Bayt. One of the things that they've told us, they say, Give this from our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. For a successful relationship, I want my wife to feel like a flower. The Prophet says this, give gifts to one another, you will love one another. 
give gifts to him. And it specifically mentioned the hadith. Small gifts also have this effect. So we don't have to be one of those people who says, I'm going to wait until Valentine's Day. And then I'll get her something. What about small gifts? And sisters, by the way, please, if you can help out in this also. Some sisters, when their husbands give them gifts, if it's not the right gift, it's not the right color, you can see it on her face. Jazakumullah khairan. What's really important, brothers and sisters, is the thought that counts, right? I want to encourage the right culture. The idea that you were thinking about me, that's what important. The gift itself, that's of secondary importance, right? We can encourage this. We can encourage the right culture. We can both be giving gifts. We can be appreciating these gifts. There's also a secret that I'm going to mention later. This is a verse of Quran. This is what Allah says. La in shakartum la azidannakum. If you are grateful, I will give you more. If you're grateful, I will give you more. That brother or sister who says that my relationship with my spouse is actually a means of me getting closer to Allah. I want from Allah, for instance, for my spouse to be more giving more gifts. La in shakartum la azidanakum. I can't just thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I also have to thank the spouse. I want to encourage this culture, right? I want to encourage this as a culture. Number three, uh, number four. In addition to showing our love with our, by being affectionate and make our wife feel like she's a flower in that way, in addition to these gifts, writing cards, right? writing gifts, writing sweet lines to one another. You'll see in Nahj al maybe some of you have read the letter of Amirul Mu'minin to his son. They say his son lived in the same city. Amirul Mu'minin is an affectionate father. He's definitely told his son how much he cares about him. Why would Ali write a letter and put that much inf- emphasis, how much he cares about you, I think about you, you're so important to me? Why do that? Written love, brothers and sisters, is very important. We want to take that time out. And your, your thoughts also come to you. When you sit down and you're going to write something, your thoughts come to you. How you really feel about that person comes to you. By the way, brothers and sisters, you can write cards to your kids also. Right? Where you tell them how you think about them. How you're thinking, right? How much you care for them. Those things that you put down in writing, they stay. And they're very important. We make sure, want to make sure we, we keep those in mind. Number, or number, we'll go with number five now. Number five is this, brothers and sisters appreciating the work that our wives do in the house, appreciating the efforts that go into being a good housewife. If our sisters are working, brothers and sisters, keep this in mind, if somebody's working, there's a sister who's working, in reality, she's working two jobs. She has a full-time job as being a mother and a wife. In addition to that full-time job, she may be outside. There's a lot of work that goes into being a good mother and a good wife. And for sisters, keep this in mind. That's your first priority. If you're not in a situation where you're fighting to survive, right? because some sisters are actually fighting to survive. But if you're not, you're, you're working because you want a better standard of life. If it comes at the price of being a mother, if it comes at the price of being a good wife, that's one of those times we have to say that no, that's incorrect. Work is not more important than family. Those are one of those times that we have to make sure that we Take care of them. Now, something else too, because I'm going to encourage our brothers to be leaders. We're going to come to that. But when you're being a leader, sometimes you actually have to discipline or tell your wife not to do something. I'll mention this. This is something we hear from senior ulama. Brothers and sisters, sisters, keep this in mind also. Don't discipline your spouse in front of the children. Don't discipline... There's a, a sister might do this. That my husband made a mistake. He said something in front of everybody. I put him in his place. Or God forbid it's a husband. The wife made a mistake. She did something wrong. I have to tell her about her mistake. There's one time behind closed doors. I explain to her. I talk to her. I tell her, no, this is a mistake. We can't do these things. These are incorrect. There's another time in front of the kids. A weakened mother is not good for anybody in the relationship. I've destroyed our position. That's not good for anybody in the relationship. So these kind of things, being shouting, screaming, physical violence, unfortunately, in some Muslim households, the husband can't keep up with the words. 
Some sisters, they need to be real careful. There's some sisters who are very sharp with their tongues. They can rip you to shreds. They're sisters like that. You know, sisters are laughing, but they know. <laughs> and for some of us guys, we're not able to keep up with the words. The sister's over there, and she is lighting into them, razor sharp. And he can't keep up with the words. What happens when he can't keep up with the words? Sometimes violence, sometimes swearing, pushing, because I can't say the, the me, same mean things. Right? Brothers and sisters, we want to be real careful about pushing one another away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We said that one of us is libas for the other, and the other is libas for the other. Last point, and this one, I'll see if I can explain it properly. For good sisters, good Muslims, and I want to explain this for fathers to keep in mind, and sisters also to keep in mind. For good Muslim sisters... They learn from the very beginning to be chaste. They don't tease. They don't flirt. Good Muslim sisters. They're interacting with the opposite gender in a very respectful way, in a proper way. They're going to school. They're getting education. All of these things, they're interacting with the opposite gender. But they don't learn how or they don't use their feminine charms on the opposite gender. For some women, even once they get married, they don't know how to be girlish around their husband and get what they want in that way. Some women, when they talk to their husbands, it's like you're talking to Chuck Norris. <laughs> this is how it is. Huh? Where, where is women? I don't know, maybe sisters shouldn't listen to me for a second, right? But for a woman to be girlish is kryptonite for a man. If she's soft, she's sweet. Imagine there's a little girl. I'm just giving an example. There's a little girl, and she, her father is going to discipline her. Some, there's a mistake that's been made. And then she starts being a little girl around her daddy. Right? He's trying to go over. I'm trying to be serious with you. I'm so sorry, daddy. Please. Right? How can... Right? Being girlish, being sweet, using the baby voice. Right? Seriously, this is, keep that in mind. You can do that. I Men like that. It works. Why, why be... No. It's a little man talking to a big man. That's not going to work. So the last, thing, the last thing is the idea that when we say the, the remainder of that hadith from Ali, he says, women are flowers, they're not maids. Women are flowers and not maids. This one let me explain properly. It does not mean that women should not do housework, that it's beneath their dignity. No, Fatima to Zahra, salamullahi alayha, she did housework. Right? So I'm not saying that that's the case. A woman should say, no, I'm liberated. I don't do anything. Well, you're not better than Fatima to Zahra. Right? She did housework. Inside the, they went to the Prophet of Allah. Inside the house is for Fatima. Outside the house is for Ali. Right? We're not going to apologize for Islam. But what did you see from both Amirul Mu'mineen and Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam? What you saw from both of them, brothers and sisters, is that both of them would help out with the housework. SubhanAllah. Both of them. So it doesn't mean it's his duty and the wife, you better do this, take out the garbage, ordering him around. No, no, no. Right? But both of them willingly helping out. It's not beneath a man's dignity to be helping out with the housework. That's actually a good thing. Now, see a clever wife, how she would handle this. She can say to her children, you see, inside the house is for Fatima, outside the house is for Ali, but your daddy is being like Imam Ali. He's helping out with the housework. How much encouragement is that for him? How much encouragement that is for her boys, her sons? Now, we're going to move on to the responsibilities for our, um, for our sisters towards the brothers. Now this one, I have to be a little frank with you guys and explain some different things because brothers and sisters, we want to raise our boys to be men and not be effeminate. We want to raise our girls to be women. We want to raise our girls to be flowers. We want to raise our girls to be gentle and accommodating inside the house. We don't want role reversal. Some people, because of the Western influence, the way they're raising their boys, boys aren't men anymore. Instead of men being protectors, careful, looking out, like a boss, for Lady Zainab, you see the guys are so weak. Sometimes this happens. Even in marriage proposals, the guy will openly tell the girl, well, are you going to work? How much money are you going to bring? 
in the marriage proposal. Her duty, his duty is to provide. We'll go over the ayat. Right? His duty is to provide, right? But we have to raise men to be men, not just males, not just paychecks, right? We have to raise them to be men. So one of the things that we have to talk about, brothers and sisters, the idea of not having role reversal, what does it take to make a successful marriage? And I'm going to say something that's not politically correct. Brothers and sisters, when you look, I said the, the, the description for women was they were flowers, they were rehana. What is the description for men in the relationship in the Quran? The, the verse of Quran says this, Ar-rijalu qawamuna ala nisa Ar-rijalu qawamuna ala nisa Qiyam, somebody who is qiyam bi amr akhar Somebody who is qiyam bi amr akhar is somebody who takes care of the affairs of another And this word is what we call mubalagha This person is really a leader Qawam um, I don't know, I'm trying to look for a word in English. Would you say, a man, how would you say, a regular manager, someone who's a real leader. Right? What would you call that person? Qawam. Men are supposed to be qawam. They're supposed to be leaders of their families. And by the way, since you're raising your boys from the time they're young to be men, to be responsible, that means the training starts early. That means our boys, from the time they were young, the same way that we did for our girls, from the time before, they were, they were, we made sure that they knew how to be a housewife, how to cook food. Not that the only thing my girl ever learned was to go to school. She, couldn't, she can't cook to save her life. She doesn't know how to wash clothes. She, right? The same thing for our boys. Have we trained our boys from the time they're young? Responsibility. Difficult tasks. Looking out for others. Providing. Right? Being a man. And then also given the responsibility of leadership. Yes, we want our boys, and I'm wondering how our sisters can do this. How do I raise my boys in this day and age so my boys are strong men? They're like a boss. I'm going to go quick, inshallah. So, one of the things, brothers and sisters, is the idea that a leader has to be obeyed. A leader has to be obeyed. You can't have a leader who doesn't have any sort of authority. He can't say anything. He can't do anything. Right? In some families, you can see the wife wears the, the pants. She might not even have to say anything. I heard a story once. They saw this couple. It was their golden anniversary. They asked the couple. They said, um, what is your secret? You've had such a happy, successful marriage. How did you do it? What did you do? The guy said, it's real simple. He said, when we first got married, my wife and I went to the Grand Canyon. We went for a trip to the Grand Canyon, and we decided to go down the Grand Canyon on horseback. He said, we went a little bit down the Grand Canyon, and then my wife's horse stumbled. My wife almost fell down off the horse. And my wife said very quietly, that's one. He said, we went a little further, the horse stumbled again. My wife again said, that's two. He said, the third time when the, wife, the horse stumbled, my wife took out her revolver. She shot the horse dead between the eyes. And I was like, are you crazy? What did you do? The horse stumbled. What's wrong with you? You don't shoot up. She looked quietly at me and she said, that's one. <laughs> so in some families, the, the, seriously, there's, the man's not the leader in the house. He's the leader as long as he obeys his wife. As long as he keeps saying the right things, Bismillah, yes, lead. But when you're a leader is when I disagree. And the wife willingly supports. Tell some, make she, like this is very important. Sisters, keep this in mind. Because you believe, you sisters and brothers, all khair is in God's hands. Your husband is not actually the person who provides you with anything. It's God. Your only responsibility is to do your part. So my part is to express my feelings to my husband in a way that's clear. And then after that, I allow him to lead. He's not my provider. I want to move to a certain area. Does your husband make the decision or does God? What's my duty? I just have to express my feelings and then after that, encourage him and tell him to go over and lead. So, brothers and sisters, there's... Many things that we want to keep in mind for this. The idea of ruling over the hearts is very important. For our, when we say a leader, 
We want to, our men to be imamul qulub. That means logical. That means reasoning. But after that, we want them to fearlessly be able to make decisions. So, I want to summarize now because I want to listen to the Masayib like everybody else. Another thing that's very important for a relationship, I mentioned this maybe on the first or second night, is that your husband is respected in his own home. Respected in front of other people. That no matter what happens, unconditionally, even if there's difficulty, it doesn't mean that the wife will go over and let him have it in front of other people, right? Even if he's not being kingly, she treats him as a king and as a leader. This is absolutely important to do. Now, a couple of areas where it's actually wajib for the wife to obey. Wajib. And I'll mention these areas. And again, this just shows the importance. How much is this important for having a successful relationship, right? If it's to the extent that God says it's wajib, then definitely that's very important. There's different areas where it's necessary for a woman to obey her husband, and this is necessary for a successful relationship. Sisters need to teach this to their daughters so their daughters know what to do. One of the things is maintaining her appearance, dressing up for her husband, looking good for her husband. Let's say there was a woman who naturally had a mustache. Right? People have that. Right? And the husband says, well, I don't like your mustache. I'd like you. The woman, that's how Allah made me. I do whatever I want. No, actually, it's wajib, according to the marja. According to the marja. If the husband says, I would like you to exercise, look good for me, dress up for me, this is ex- actually wajib. The other area is the intimate relationship. The other area is leaving the house without his permission. She can't just storm out of the house. It's mentioned in the Risala. So see some of the areas that are necessary. But brothers and sisters, inshallah, we'll stop with this. And inshallah, we'll hear the Messiah of Ahlul Bayt. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad.